Okay. Well, I think a good place to start is just you guys have booked so much of this tour in sort of smaller venues or theater club size venues. Uh -huh. Does that feel right for the band now? Well, I think there's sort of this attitude of a hardcore Soundgarden fan that's kind of always been there. Um, and I also think there's kind of an energy that happens in theaters that doesn't happen in, in arenas that um, kind of fits almost best for us. Like, we learned early on that we could take a, like, handle a really big stage inside, outside, and it was kind of great, and we were sort of suited for it. Um, but on the other hand, our music is kind of dark, and there's a sort of dark intimacy that works really well in smaller places. And so it was kind of the decision to, like, let's, let's take this tour and this new album out to uh, places where it's not like a, a come one, come all sort of feeding frenzy, but focus on the, on the hardcore fans that have been following, following us all this time. Um, and so that's why we did it. And then having said that, um, it's, it's a lot of young people in the audience, a lot. So, you know, it's interesting. So now that you've completed a tour in this size of room, does that, is that working or will you go back to larger venues? It's, at some point, we'll go back to larger venues, I think. Yeah, the, the, it, one thing that it does is if you play a theater, like in, in the Wiltern here in Los Angeles, where this is three nights in a row. Um, if you're a band on tour and, and, and you're like trying to make money, it makes much more sense to play one big place and then move on. And then you can do a lot more places. And um, for my money, it's more fun to do three nights in a smaller place. But, you know, at the end of the day, particularly as, as uh, in a bad economy with uh, costs don't get lower even though the economy's bad it's higher and it's like you want to bring your show to and your music to as many people as you can so at some point i think we'll open it up and play bigger places prior to these three shows had you guys played the will turn before i have personally i don't think soundgarden did um but i also have a really bad memory for that kind of thing like it, i'm kind of in the moment at least in that way, performance on stage in the moment, kind of doing that. Um, there are places that kind of stand out, but to me, like, the, the last 25 years of touring is kind of a blur, and I remember things like, um, you know, like a, a single instance, seeing somebody die in front of me, which happened once. Um, they brought him back to life, so I can say it on TV, it's okay. It's a, it ended happily, it was okay. Um, things like that, but um, the Wiltern's a good, a good example of like a, of a great theater for what we do. You know, it sounds good, it's, uh, it's older, it feels like, a, you know, like a, an event space to me. It feels like a space where you can come in and feel like you've seen a rock concert not like you've been in a club, but it's not the Enormo Dome where everything's echoing and it's just really a sports arena and it's not made for performances or music really, you know. The Wiltern's great. When you're in that moment, how much does the space sort of dictate the kind of performance you're able to give? I'm not sure. Um, I think it's the people. And I, and I think that... Uh, that's always going to be the case for me. I think like a, a beautiful environment or a crazy environment or, a, you know, we played CBGB's four times. Um, the, if you went into, there, there was no dressing room and the, and the men's room at least, all, it just had a toilet coming out of the wall with no toilet seat, nothing around it. And, you know, we've gone from there to playing like lavish, beautiful, expensive, lush venues with amazing sound systems and legendary outdoor places like Red Rocks and um, Joe Robbie Stadium and everything in between. Um, and none of that, Wembley, none, none of that is going to take precedence over what the feeling is from the audience and the faces that you see because they're right there. And they're 
they're kind of reacting to you, and you're reacting to them, and uh, that, that sort of uh, emotional ki kind of uh, reaction, and it, it sort of takes off on its own. Um, and that's the biggest thing. Then it doesn't matter where you are. It could be a thousand people or a or hundred thousand people. The feeling inside me or, or any performer is going to be just the same. It's not going to be bigger because there's more people. Um, not to me. Maybe to some people. When you were writing the new album, were you thinking about the live performance or how these songs would translate? Classically, I have thought that. Um, on this album, I guess because we hadn't, we hadn't toured in so long, that wasn't the first thing on my mind. Um, and I, I don't think that I really understood how different the new material is to previous albums until um, we started integrating it into the set list and just in, even in the context of rehearsal, like you know, playing five new songs and then moving back to the older ones, it was like, wow, this is actually really different. This is, um, it's a bigger jump than I had ever thought about. Um, and since then, obviously, I think about it, but th there's been times in my career when I've thought, in terms of sitting and, and writing songs, like, God, it would be really helpful to the live show if we had something that felt like X. Um, for the most part, though, you know, we write songs kind of one song at a time, and it's based on the inspiration and the idea. We are the furthest that you can get from a band that's conceptually driven. I don't think we've ever had a meeting where we sat down and said, let's discuss the direction of the new album. What would, what would we all like it to be? Never once have we done that. Um, we have four guys, all with musical ideas that come in. We show each other those ideas, we start working on them, and then that's it. It's, you know, it's off to the races, so. So when it came time to make a set list for this tour, how did you create cohesion between those old songs and the new ones? Um, it's kind of common sense, you know. Um, you're in a rehearsal room, you're playing them in a row, you're kind of, you know what the tempos are doing. Uh, we have like, 12 or 14 different guitar tunings. That's always kind of something that happens. You know, you don't want to be changing the guitar on every single song. So we try to put some of those in a group, that kind of thing. And then if that doesn't work, we will separate them. But um, I don't know if that's that challenging. Um, and then you, you come out the first time with whatever that set list is and, and with those new songs integrated. And then over the course of a few nights, you figure out, you learn more as you see people react to it. Um, you were saying there were a lot of new or young fans in the crowd. A lot. What are they reacting to the most? I, don't, I can't say that, it, that it's necessarily different. Um, and I would, I would compare it to myself. As a, as a young teenager, my, my hobby became and my passion became uh, finding somewhat obscure records. Like I, as a, an early teen, I was not a fan of the Rolling Stones. I was not a fan of Led Zeppelin. I was not a fan of a lot of bands that I, that I love now uh, because it was, they were on the radio all the time. I heard it all. It, it wasn't special to me. Anyone could have it and anyone could hear it. So. Uh, I was more interested in obscure things that if I could sit and listen to and then play for my friends and they would have never heard it before. Um, and I could sit in my room and listen to it and it would be, always be new. I didn't know the words already because I heard it on, on the radio a thousand times. So I think that sort of holds true with young Soundgarden fans because I see them kind of singing along to lyrics from albums that came out 23, 25 years ago. And, um, that's because they've discovered it and, and went and, and bought the record and listened to it. And it's that sort of, I think it's that uh, journey of discovery also that kind of makes it theirs. And, and um, a, a young person's relationship to music is completely different. Um, it's, it's a badge, it's, it's the outfit you wear, it's the group that you, have decided to either reject or to join, um, 
or you know, reject everything. It's, it's how you separate yourself from everyone else. And w what makes me excited is to see young people and young people that know a lot of these old songs and realize that, that they're doing what I did as a teenager um, with our music, and that's the whole point. Do you feel like there's one song each night that feels like the emotional center to the set list or something that the set revolves around? I think you, as soon as you feel like there's like a, a song that is kind of always um, coming across energetically and emotionally the same, then it changes. Like they, that sort of betrays you. Like you, you think you know what the songs do and what impact they have on the audience night after night. Um, and you can count on that and it's just not true. Um, not, not, at least not for me. It, it's always evolving. And I also think, and, and Soundgarden is really uh, very good at this. As we tour and as we play, songs evolve live. Um, I don't know if it's out, it's just out of almost, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but it's out of boredom. If you played a song in front of an audience 30 times in a row, you start to approach it differently and you find new things about it. And oftentimes, um, my least favorite songs live become my favorite songs live because there was something about not loving to play it that bothered me. So I figured out some way to approach it that, that I did love and then it, it changed. We put out an album, uh, a live album, that is a, a a bunch of songs taken from a West Coast tour that we did in 1996 uh, called Live on I-5 and, and we had a truck out on the road recording it, analog to tape, and we had actually forgotten we had those tapes. Um, we just we discovered them and having never heard them, it was amazing to listen to the live performances of all that stuff because I don't remember any of what we were doing to those songs. We were changing them kind of dr dramatically and we don't play them like that now. Um, and it's also exciting because all of the brand new songs or even songs that we're playing now from our catalog that we actually have never really toured with, um, they're going through the live metamorphosis and changing every day and becoming something new and, and evolving. They're living things. And as they evolve, you know, they don't sort of reach a finish line. They keep evolving. Seeing that you guys are a rock band that have been around for so long, how do you feel about the state of rock music? Now, and where do you see it going? I don't know. I mean, I, th I think there's always rock music. I don't think anybody can really sit here and, and articulately tell you what rock music is and have that actually be true to everyone. Um, and I also get into a lot of con conversations with people uh, about rock in terms of shouldn't it be the most successful musical genre and I've never felt that. I've always felt like rock music is to a degree for the, the, the people that don't necessarily um, have a voice or aren't necessarily accepted or um, uh, successful at other things in life as a young person. And it could be a family issue. It could be I'm not good at school. It could be I'm not good at sports. It could be... Um, it could be, this is how I want to identify with myself and my own feelings. It's a different thing. Um, and th that's not about um, mass production or mass appeal. It's not, I'm never going to sort of beat the punk, uh, the punk rock Bible or the rock and roll Bible and say, everyone in the world should like this more. Um, I think rock is something that you fight for. It's kind of a, it's like a right and a privilege. and. It's rocking because it's not like everything else. It's not what the Everly Brothers was when it was coming out of the TV. Um, so, it, you know, the more obscure it gets, the, the more likely um, people are going to find really good music to listen to. Yeah, I mean, I'd have to compare theaters to 
arenas to clubs. The, the venue certainly affects the way we play, but it's a function of a lot of things. It's, it's whether they serve alcohol or not, whether they have seats or not, and the capacity. Uh, a small club is more intimate. It's great if you're playing for your peers and friends. A large venue like an arena is a lot of fun if you have an open floor and, and, and fans could mosh around or whatever it is that they want to engage in. Theaters are great for uh, sort of a combination of both, you know. And at this point in Soundgarden's career, why did you guys decide to do these sort of more intimate shows? Uh, I think one of the reasons that Soundgarden decided to play these intimate theaters was an opportunity to make it special for the fans. Um, obviously, it'd be easier for us to get into a city and play one or two shows as opposed to multiple nights in the same theater. But we could play longer sets, cre create a, a more intimate environment for, for the fans. And I think, ultimately, to have people see us in, in, in a context which perhaps they haven't before or may not in the future, um, is, is something that we considered ourselves being fans. You know, if we, if we wanted to, I'd rather go see a band in a theater than in an arena. Um, although, I probably enjoy going to a small bar to see a band. So is that the next Soundgarden tour? Small <laughs> bars. <laughs> yep. And when it came time to make the set list, how did you balance the older material with the newer songs? Well, um, the set lists are constructed primarily by our drummer, Matt. And he arranges it dynamically, thinking about tempos and, and I imagine his stamina, you know, which he seems to have an unlimited supply of. Um, so, and if we're playing multiple nights, you know, we, we have enough material that we can kind of mix it up especially for people who might come both nights, so. Does that affect, you know, how you would play a show, knowing that someone may come three nights in a row? The, the fact that people might come multiple nights consecutively affects the set list, and the set list will affect how we perform the show, our familiarity with the song and, and, and our, the degree to which we enjoy that particular song. I, I feel, and I believe the rest of the band, feels an intimate, strong connection to the older material. Um, obviously, because we, we've played them you know, over a long period of time, there's a, there's a sentimental attachment that we might have to a song, how it was constructed, where we learned it, particular memories of where we've played it, and you know, um, locations, bands we played with, friends of ours. Music in general has that kind of sentimental tug emotionally with people, at least with popular music especially. So it does for us as well. Is there one particular song that you feel like is, you know, a center point for the set each night? No, no, because the, the sets are juggled from day to day for the most part. There are a few songs we tend to play every night. I don't think there's a focal point. You know, we weren't really a, uh, a hit-oriented band, so for that reason, there isn't that one song that... For, I, I imagine our biggest song was probably Black Hole Sun, and I don't think we've played it in the past few days. We'll probably play it tonight, and that's been a relief. And our, our fans do not seem disappointed that they haven't heard Black Hole Sun. That's fine with me. I think Soundgarden fans could do just fine without the hits. You know, I, I think hit-oriented fans might be disappointed. But we have to think about ourselves. We're a little bit selfish in that way. How do you feel like these newer songs, you know, fit in with those old songs or compared to the old songs? They fit in great. Um, you know, when, when songs age, when songs age, we have an opportunity to sort of take them apart and reassemble them. You know, we, we approach the song differently from guitar or bass, drums, vocals. It's always changing. Um, but we still kind of keep the recognizable whole. The new material on the other hand, hasn't gone through a lot of that metamorphosis or, or, or series of <laughs> metamorphoses. So, um, is that correct? <laughs> Plural. Um, but the new material is fresh, so it, it holds our attention and we anticipate our ability to go ahead and perform a song that, that we, we, 
that doesn't have a history. So I guess it's a little bit of both, you know? I mean, we have short attention spans like, like anybody else. So an older song will change. A newer song is, is, is fresh and we're attracted to it for, for that reason. So either way, you know, the songs are fitting in the set. Impact what sort of set you deliver? Kind of doesn't. What it affects is the mood of the crowd. Like if they sit and they come in knowing they're going to be sitting, then they they're fine with it, you know. And then we feed off the mood of the crowd. But we pretty much change up our set anyway every night. Doesn't matter where we're at. So it keeps it fresh and fun. Are there certain you know, cities or venues where you know you're going to have to deliver more energy or a different set because of that? Nope. We just know there's towns like Philly and Oakland that you know they're going to bring the energy and they always do. They always deliver. Same with Detroit. It doesn't matter where you play. They just go wild. Have you guys played the Will Turn before? No, I've never even heard of it until we got to town. This is a great place. I like it. Why choose to play these sort of smaller, more intimate venues? I love it. It's really cool. I think it sounds good here too. I don't know. That's what I care about more for the fans to like be able to hear everything correctly. It's more like a gift to the fans, I guess, to like to get to play in an intimate place and just warm up. Because that's really the professional way to answer that. But I have my own theories on why and why we did where we toured and stuff. Yeah, but I won't say them. <laughs> Now that you're at the end of this tour, that that was a good idea, that the fans are happy with that? I think so. I think it was a really good idea. It was really fun, and I can't believe it's already over. But it's also one of the longest feeling short tours in the world. Because a, a month tour really isn't that long, or three weeks, three and a half weeks isn't really that long. But it, this tour seems amazing. A lot has happened. You know, we've been through the East Coast and coming out to the West Coast and they were like, uh, we played the inauguration for Obama and all kinds of stuff has happened. And it's just been really fun. And I think the fans have generally this whole tour have been really ecstatic about it and like way into it. Each town feels like they got something different, you know? That's what it seems like. I don't know for sure. Is there any downside to playing a more intimate venue? No. I don't think so. I think it's better. I always like to play places where I would go see a show, you know? You get playing arenas and stuff. I wouldn't go see a show in arenas. Yeah. Never sounds good. It's always this flat vibe that's not your own, you know? But these are cool. You would go see a show here at the Wilter? Yeah. Yeah, I would. I would go... When the Warfield in... We didn't play there, but we played the Warfield many years ago. Um, in San Francisco, and that's kind of like the kind of place, a lot like this, but it was more like dance oriented. You know, it's one of those old style theaters with the the dinner table area, and then the dance floor, and then the stage, right? So it's that. It's like it's one of those places that I always held as the barometer of like, wow, this is where I would go see a show, and it's really fun to play there. You know, so even early in the '90s, I was like, man, this is the kind of place that would be perfect to play if we could just stay playing shows like this. And when you do a several night stand in one venue, do you find that that familiarity each night can make the show better? Yeah, actually. I think the, the second night, because the first night you get used to it, kind of, and then the second night, it gives you a weird advantage on how to, what you're gonna hear and what it's like, because every show is different and the monitors act different, the sound seems different. And, but you know, by the second or third show, it's totally dialed in, ready to go. So what have you figured out about this venue specifically that you're ready to deliver tonight? Well, I've got to keep that secret. It's a job security. I won't tell anybody that stuff. No, I'm only kidding. Uh, that there's those little walls down there. I don't know if you can see them on the camera shot. But they redesigned this place. I guess there used to be seats all the way up to the stage, and they took that out. So there's kind of a pit, but there's a walkway 
with a pony wall that you know you walk down and and that is really weird to see how the crowd tears itself how where they run into the the wall and like this is where i'm standing you know they're not only at the rail they're at those walls they picked those walls so you can see the first night we were here i thought there was like oh there's probably 200 people here yeah no wonder it's sold out you know and then you realize no this place is way bigger because you can't really see up here until Keeley turns the lights on up here or whatever. So that's what I figured out, that there's actually more people here than you think, and you can see everybody if you look at them. You know, and they're, they're pretty into it. For an L.A. crowd, they're... And for such small space, they move as much as they can, you know? And now that you've done two shows, is there a certain song or, a, you know, a period of songs that the L.A. crowd seems particularly into? Nope. Never, not in any town, not just L.A., just there isn't like a... One of our shows, we had somebody come up, I think it was in New York, and Chris invited this guy up because he said, hey, can I play on a song? And we brought him up. Now almost, well, not every show, but a lot of shows, there will be someone holding up a, can I play on this song, you know, a poster? And you usually go, no, 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 that's our job. That's our fun. And how do you feel like the new songs have been fitting in with the old songs when you've been playing them on this tour? Left hand and right hand, they've totally matched. They totally fit right in. It's still Soundgarden. You know, since you guys have been a rock and roll band for so long, how do you feel about the current state of rock music? And I thought we were a soul band myself. I really did. I think we should go that direction. Soul and R&B. I don't know what the current state of rock and roll is. That's up to everyone else. I just play the hell out of my guitar when I have my guitar on. I have no idea what everybody else is listening to or into. And all my favorite bands keep making a couple records and then breaking up and like, eh, whatever. So I don't know. I don't know that uh, about the spirit that everybody's into with rock and roll and what kind of spirit it needs to keep going forward or actually being a vital artistic release in the world, and I don't know that it should be. Maybe it should just be a lust thing. Maybe it should just be a total spirit thing, and not some art thing. I don't like the careerists. I don't like the artists. I don't, that's a long philosophical bullshit session, though, that I know we don't have time for. What sort of vibe you're getting from the Will Turn specifically, and how does it feel after playing two shows here? Is that impacting the sort of set you're able to give? Um, well, I think one of the benefits of playing uh, multiple nights in uh, one venue is you get used to the sound and the acoustics, and um, we're able to sort of gauge uh, what the set list, um, you know, what what songs might work better in, in this type of setting, depending on, uh, you know, the the previous night sound and the audience and all that kind of stuff. And historically, what has been Soundgarden's relationship to Los Angeles? Well, let's see. Um, we played, I guess our first tour in 1987, we played San Francisco, Los Angeles, um, San Diego. Uh, so we've, we've played here a lot from in the early days. We used to play uh, Club Lingerie and The Scream and um, uh, Anti-club, you know, various various places like all around Hollywood and um, Orange County and all that kind of stuff. So, and we also used to be on the SST record label, so we would come down to Lawndale quite a bit and hang out with the SST staff. So, we have a long history with LA. How do you feel about the crowds in LA? Is there something special about that? Well, uh, a lot of times there's a lot of industry type crowds here. You know, I mean, there certainly was in the early days. So they just kind of like fold their arms and like. They don't really emote very much, but I think once we got established as a as a good live band, we started to get a lot more kind of like just lively, real fans, you know. But you know, but that's always uh, that always happens in industry towns like you know New York and L.A. Sometimes there's there's kind of the industry attitude, but uh, but it's always been like awesome, you know. And these shows that you've been playing at the World Tour this week, how? Crowd's been great. I mean, it's been nice because we uh, we have kind of a standing uh, 
floor situation down here, and I think that works really good for our band. Um, but uh, people really seem to be enjoying it, so it's been great. And I hear you're the one in charge of the set list? Uh, yeah, yeah. I've been writing the set list for this, this tour, and um, it's been really fun, you know? Uh, we've been trying to learn as many uh, obscure B-sides as we could for this particular tour, so it's been fun to intersperse those um, on different nights. If we're playing consecutive nights, we're trying to mix up uh, songs in the set list as well as the sequence of the set list, so I really enjoy doing that. And I, I, I can kind of like gauge what, you know, what tempo or what type of groove is gonna work in, a, in the set, you know? So it's, it's been really fun and the guys have been receptive to it. What's the most obscure song you're digging up? Well, uh, there's one called Blind Dogs that we're going to attempt tonight. We've never played it live before, so <laughs> fingers crossed. Have you rehearsed it before? We've just rehearsed it twice, yeah. Uh, so hopefully that'll be enough. We were actually curious if you guys still feel a connection with Seattle and the Seattle music scene. Um, well, I guess our, our connection is... Uh, certainly tied to the music scene that we had in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, just because we were playing more shows locally back then and, and all the musicians and bands that we knew were, it was very tight knit. Uh, but I think our relationship with the Seattle music scene now is, I guess as sort of, you know, elder statesmen or, you know, kind of one of the more established groups, you know. Um, but we certainly uh, know a lot of new and up and coming groups and and it's always nice to sort of interact with uh, what's, you know, like the, the newer generation of musicians there now. And there's, there's a lot of really great stuff, like, you know, Macklemore's blowing up, and we got Rain Wolf, and uh, Death Cab, and Mother's Finest, a, lo a lot of really cool bands.